when you want to deploy a complex application in virtual environment and it can be as easy as server virtualization where you have just a few segments or it could be as complex as large public cloud environment where every tenant wants to have a few maybe even up 10 or even more than 10 segments and you have thousands or tens of thousands of tenants in all cases you have to implement virtual segments somehow you have to give your tenants independent virtual segments that they can consume without being on the same segment with some other tenant. And you have to provide some baseline networking functionality. So layer two connectivity is a given. Every single solution should provide that or maybe layer three connectivity, but let's not go there. Ideally, a solution would provide layer three connectivity, load balancing and firewalling, both within a segment and between segments. And of course, then we come to the requirements of unlimited mobility and scalability, which are obviously hard to do if we are limiting ourselves to certain technologies. And then the questions like, shall we support layer two flooding? Is there something that still needs that? Shall we have layer two or layer three segments? Shall we support IP multicast or not? The designers of VXLAN decided that they will use VXLAN to implement layer two segments. So VXLAN is effectively implementing an Ethernet segment. For the old timers, it's the equivalent of virtualized thick Ethernet cable. You want to know more about the alternative solutions? I am describing probably like a dozen solutions in the overlay virtual networking webinar. There you will find more about all the alternatives. In this webinar, we'll focus exclusively on what's going on in the VXLAN space. People have implemented the requirement of having numerous virtual segments with VLANs traditionally. The early implementations of VLANs combined a stupid hypervisor switch with stupid core switches. I'm usually joking that this is as good as these poor ladies manually operating a phone exchange and using physical cables to connect the subscribers. The networking industry, because they couldn't influence the hypervisor virtual switches, and of course because they like to sell hardware, started going down the path of making the core smarter, where in this situation the core includes the top of rack switches, don't forget that, so the core is all the hardware and edge is the hypervisor. They went down the path of making the core smarter, and trying to make the top of Rex, which is VM aware. And we have tons of different solutions in this space. There is only one that is standardized, EVB or Edge Virtual Bridging, which is an IEEE standard. Every single vendor has something in this space. Whenever I'm talking with a vendor that is promoting these solutions, I'm always teasing them by quoting RFC 1925, which actually says that with sufficient thrust, pigs fly just fine. There's this elderly gentleman, he's a grumpy old man like myself, Randy Bush, who said in one of his presentations, yeah, I know pigs fly just fine, but can we afford the fuel costs? Because we, the networking people are the ones that are paying for the fuel. A few years ago, an alternative started to emerge in mainstream commercial products because people were using GRE tunnels to bridge between hypervisors even way before that. Amazon VPC proved a few years ago that you can actually build an overlay virtual networking solution that scales to huge sizes. Not long after that, Cisco came out with the first VXLAN implementation on Nexus 1000V. Microsoft announced MVGRE a few days after that, implemented it, if I remember correctly, a year later, and then there was VMware, NSX, and so on and so on. If we stay on the VLAN side for just another minute, 
so that you'll see the difference between the two. If you want to build a large scale, let's say cloud infrastructure or server virtualization infrastructure that uses VLANs to implement virtual segments, obviously you need large layer two fabrics. And every single vendor can build you a fabric with thousands of ports. Arista has to use two core switches and MLAC. Juniper has their QFabric, Cisco has FabricPath, Brocade has VCS Fabric, and so on, and so on, and so on. HP now supports both Trill and SPB, Avaya has SPB. So every single vendor can build you a huge layer 2 fabric that you need to run VLANs over it. Our first question is, do we really need a huge fabric? And it turns out that most hypervisor platforms don't support that many hosts anyway. VMware in the distributed switch supports up to 1,000 hosts. Nexus 1000V latest release supports 250 hosts. And regardless of what we do, you know, today you can pack like 50 virtual machines on a host, so you have 50,000 virtual machines. You only have 4,000 VLANs. And you have one single failure domain. Yet again, you want to know more about this particular topic, I go into more details in the Overlay Virtual Networking webinar. The point here is that, yes, you can build a Layer 2 fabric that has no spanning tree, but eventually the flooding will kill you. The other thing that will cause severe headache is the number of MAC addresses. If you use most of the layer two fabric solutions, at least in the edge switches, you'll see all the MAC addresses in the whole network. In some solutions, you'll see the MAC addresses in the core as well. And most switches can support either 64,000 or 128,000 MAC addresses. There are even high end switches on the market that support 16,000 MAC addresses today. Obviously, building large server virtualization or cloud environment with VLANs is not a good idea. And anyway, even the designers of Trill admitted that with today's technologies, a broadcast domain can support around 1,000 N hosts. If we use the traditional way of building VLAN-based networks, where just to get rid of the interaction with the server and virtualization people, the networking people configure every VLAN on every server port. And this is the common design that I see in almost all server virtualization environments. Effectively, by doing that, you have turned the whole network into one broadcast domain, which means that the whole network can support around 1,000 end hosts. And these end hosts are not hypervisors. These end hosts are virtual machines because the virtual machines are the ones that generate the broadcasts. By using this very common design that everyone loves to use because it's simple, where you have every VLAN on every server port, you effectively limited the scalability of your network to approximately 1,000 VMs, maybe a low few thousands. Yet again, this has nothing to do with spanning tree. It applies equally well to Trill or SPB or whichever fabric solution. VXLAN was created to address those limitations and to bypass many of them. It was designed to emulate simple layer 2 segments. So it emulates Ethernet. It uses IP transport. It's MAC over IP encapsulation with some additional headers that we'll go into in just a few minutes. They knew they had to emulate layer two flooding. That was a design decision. Microsoft, for example, made a totally different design decision with Hyper-V. They said, we will have a layer three only solution. And if someone is still using some weird layer two tricks, too bad, we're not supporting that. So designers of VXLAN thought that they still had to support traditional layer two segments. They decided to run on top of UDP, and I'll show you later on why that was a good idea. And they expanded the segment field from 12 bits to 24 bits, 
which allows you to have 16 million segments, which is more than enough for almost any environment. And even in larger environments, you would want to split them into availability zones anyway. And because it's using IP encapsulation, you just need the IP transport in the network core. There is no bridging. Where would I typically use VXLAN? Well, obviously, large multi-tenant clouds are the perfect use case because they have to support extremely large number of virtual segments. And there have been many cloud providers who were running out of VLANs. If you want to link physical and virtual servers and you need to extend layer two, then sometimes VXLAN is not such a bad solution. And I'll address this use case in the second part of the webinar. And finally, even if you limit VLANs to just one high availability cluster, which in VMware's case is 32 nodes, and they're talking about extending this very soon to 64 nodes, if you want to split that high availability cluster across two racks, for example, and you don't want those two racks to become a single failure domain, then maybe it makes sense to have IP between the racks, not bridging. And in that case, VXLAN is a perfect solution. Do keep in mind that VXLAN is not a data center interconnect technology. Even though you can implement uh, stretched VLANs across multiple data centers with VXLAN, VXLAN was not designed for that regardless of what VMware's vice presidents are telling you during VMworld keynotes. And VXLAN is missing a number of features that one would want to have in any stretch layer 2 technology.